Well, good morning, Cedarville family. So great to be with you. This is our kind of rookie voyage into the Cedarville family. Let me just say, God is doing an amazing thing at Cedarville University. And we're only two months into this experience. So my first exposure to Cedarville, I was seated right back here February 2018 on a CU Friday event with Lily. We were here checking out, doing a college visit. And from that date until today, two things have stood out to me about this campus, this university. Number one is its leadership. How about students want to put your hands together for the leadership of your president, Dr. White. And all of the countless hours he and the team around him. How about the faculty and the leadership teams around Dr. White? What an amazing leadership team assembled at this university. But as great as your leadership and your faculty are, something else has stood out to me even more and that captured my heart the day I sat right back there on that CU Friday event. And students, that's your worshiping heart. There's something going on at this university in the heart of the students that's unmistakably a movement of God. And I want you to know that, and I've seen that since February 2018, and just a couple of months in to Lily's experience here affirms it. Students, God is doing a great work here. And it's a privilege to stand before you today and open God's word and to see what I saw that very first day, the hunger and thirst to walk with Christ, serve him, know him, and be about his purposes in this world. So part of the senior year in the Simpson household was what I called senior year with dad. And I said to Lily, you got to put an exclamation point on your senior year. So a couple of months ago, right before we're packing her up to move to Cedarville, I said, Lily, you need to pick an experience, something that's going to push the edges of your courage, something that you say, you know what, dad, we might die doing this. I don't know that I can do it. I'm not sure I can actually follow through on that. And I gave her like a spectrum of choices. I said, well, like we could go cage diving with sharks. Has anybody ever cage dive with sharks? No, that's an illustration, right? Neither did we. We did not choose that. I said, we could go like hike the the bottom of the Grand Canyon and back. I read a bunch of people die every year, like hiking back to the Grand Canyon and back. I said, Lily, we could do that. And she says, no, peace out on that, Dad. So here is what she picked. So Lily chose to jump out of a perfectly functional airplane at 13,000 feet. And we were doing it together. So didn't, I mean, look at her right there. I mean, she's, looks like she's killing it, right? I mean, she, she's got her thumbs up. She's smiling. I mean, right? Look at this shot of her, like when she's exiting the airplane, like she did like a flip when she's exiting the airplane. And did you see on the previous slide, you can see the airplane. Do you see it in the upper? Do you see it? That's the plane. Yeah, exactly. I want you to see if you notice anything different about my experience. Okay? Okay, let me, I just got to set the scene a little bit for you here. I got to explain a little bit, all right? So when I showed this slide to our congregation at Eagle Church, whom I've been with for 27 years, a part of the body, 25 on staff, many of them came to me and said, Pastor Eric, we have never seen your face look like that, ever. (laughs) So I'm strapped to a guy named Matt, okay? Matt is so short that if I stood up, his feet are going to (laughs) like dangle, okay? Matt's from England, He's got a deep British accent. I can't imitate it. It would be horrible, but it, he's, he's given me instructions, right? And, and Matt says to me, as we're getting close to the jump point, right, they slide the door of the plane open, which I've never been in an aircraft at 13,000 feet where they slide the door open. <laughs> and then there's like 10 of us, and Lily and I are towards the front. I mean, like the, very close to the cockpit. So like, as soon as they slide the door open, I'm watching and people are just exiting the airplane. (laughs) My brain is just like, there was like 10 of us and now there's just Lily and I and the guys we're strapped to. It's just exit. And Matt says, scoot down towards the door. So that yellow bar, do you see the yellow bar there? Okay. 
The yellow bar runs outside the aircraft. You hire a photographer to join you on these trips. My photographer's name was Luigi. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Luigi from Peru. He was like five foot two, buck 20. I mean, Luigi is hanging on the yellow monkey bar on the side of the airplane. I was sitting there going, is anybody else alarmed by this? He seemed to be on a country drive. It was like he's just hanging on the side of the airplane. He's got the camera here. He's got his little clicker. And he says to me at the doorway, he says, Eric, look up and smile. That's my attempt right there. So then Matt says to me, Eric, you need to slide off the seat and sit down. Okay? And then he whispers six words that changed my life. <laughs> Stick your feet out the door. <laughs> Cedarville, let me tell you straight up right now. I am looking down at my feet. I am looking at the clouds below me. And I'm looking at the ground. And I hear him say, stick your feet out the door. And what runs through the synapses of my brain is, why? <laughs> why? And I hear off my right shoulder, Lily says, go dad. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> Whose idea was this senior year with dad? So I take my right foot and I go like this. This slow, straight up, this is what I did. What I didn't know was, the cue is my left foot. When my left foot clears the opening, guess what that was a cue for? <laughs> Matt says, this is the, like when that cleared right here, I had in my head, Cedarville, that it was going to be sky falling. Like we were just going to fall out of the airplane and like drop. It's called sky falling. So you need to picture right here, we thrust out of the airplane <laughs> like you're jumping into a pool. All right? And then so here's the scene as I'm exiting the aircraft. <laughs> Luigi, let's go. He's yelling things like, smile, wave. Look at my mouth right there. Can you see like my, I'm like this, right? So Matt says to me, Eric, you need to do a banana when you exit. A banana, you know what I'm talking about, a banana? Like, you need to pull, like, the backs of your feet up to his lower back, like, curve yourself. I go, dude, I'm 50 years old. I got no banana. You got popsicle right here. <laughs> I said, popsicle straight down. And then here's the scene. All right, now, notice my mouth here, okay? There's a reason my mouth is wide open. Because Matt says to me as we're climbing up, you know, like, the climb feels like you could travel, you could fly to L.A. It's so long to get up to the jump. But you're just, and Matt says, Eric, you've got one job on the jump, one responsibility. I said, okay, tell me what it is. He said, breathe. I said, what? He said, breathe. That's, what you, that's all you have to do. I said, are you kidding me, Matt? He says, Eric, let me tell you, your brain does not have a category to process what it's about to experience. If you don't breathe, you're gonna black out. And he said, Eric, it's really bad at your size, like your length, if you black out, it's really hard to land. <laughs> so just breathe. I said, I said, I got that. I mean, come on, students. Like, breathe. I got that. When my left foot cleared that opening and we went over, free fall, 60 seconds, 127 miles an hour. 60 seconds. Okay? From the moment I thrust down, my mouth went wide open. And all I could do is, <laughs> but all I could hear Matt say, breathe, breathe, breathe. All I could, <laughs> That's all I had right there. That's all I'm doing. Luigi's out here going, hey, smile. Wait, wait. Ah. So students, those six words and that moment 
in my life set a new paradigm for what I think a threshold moment that Jesus calls all of us to, not just once, but multiple times in our faith journey. My guess is most of you in this room right now are somewhere at a 13,000 foot threshold level decision. And what I wanna talk about for a few minutes from John chapter six is, I wanna walk around the story in John six. So open up your Bibles there, pull out your notes, your journals I think is what you guys use, which is such an inspiring image when you see those pictures. Here's what I'm gonna do with John six. We're gonna walk around the story with John six. We're gonna look at three observations that I believe are gonna fuel, to fuel us to this point when we're standing on our own personal 13,000 foot decision right there. What's gonna help us in that moment? And then we're gonna wrap it at the end with a decision point. So here's the setting in John six. Jesus when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, that lake being the Sea of Galilee, right? 12 miles long, seven miles wide at its widest point, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. So I think I had, put the scriptures up here. Do I have it? There we go. So Capernaum would have been a very popular spot for Jesus. Peter's family was there. So it was like a hub of Jesus' ministry on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. They would have made this trek many a times to go to Capernaum, hang out with Peter's family. Jesus used it as a base. So it's a very common route. But here's what I want you to underline in your Bibles. By now, I want you to underline, it was dark, verse 17, and Jesus had not yet joined them. Verse 18, underline, a strong wind was blowing and the waters, underline, grew rough. So underline, it was dark, verse 17, underline strong wind, verse 18, and underline waters grew rough, verse 19. So I wanna make three observations now. The first one being, I want you to see now that it's Jesus who's actually leading his disciples into this space that I'm calling uncertainty. Now, if anyone had a good handle on the weather pattern, it was Jesus, if anyone who could handle making sure their ride across the lake was smooth and calm and uneventful, it was Jesus. But Jesus here allows his disciples to get into a boat and row right into the middle of a storm. Students, how many, time, how many times do you notice this about Jesus? Like values like smooth, comfortable, uneventful, convenient, those are not top shelf values with Jesus. Have you noticed this? Students, the sooner you can grasp and internalize that, the better this relationship's gonna go. Like, I confess, I personally value like clarity and control and comfort and convenience. Like, those are personal values I hold. The problem is, that's not the values Jesus holds. Like, I have to submit those to what Jesus prefers. Like, he, he's not so much. He goes, yeah, Simpson, I know you want clarity and you want convenience and you want control and you want efficiency and speed here. That's not the agenda that Jesus is operating with. And here the disciples are getting a PhD in uncertainty. So the question, right, is always, why? Why is Jesus leading us into this space? And I want you to think about what Jesus is prioritizing here in the development of these guys. Hebrews 11 says it this way, without faith, finish the sentence for me, it's impossible to what? Please God, without faith, say faith. faith. So faith, I want you to follow this now. Uncertainty is the soil in which faith flourishes. If there's no uncertainty, there's not the ingredients in place that grow our roots of faith, that deepen our trust and dependence on God. That's a big deal with Jesus. Like you wanna know what he's doing with those guys in the boat? He's developing as men of faith. And do you know how he does that? He leads them into the middle of when the waves are pounding in and the wind is howling and the skies are dark. He leads them into a space where they can't see how they're gonna get through whatever it is they're going through. He intentionally leads them there. And internally for us, what we do, we tend to push back and bristle away and, and resist that space of uncertainty. And what I want to lobby for this morning as students, do you see if we can begin to move toward and embrace that space of uncertainty and join Jesus in that storm, 
Like this is why your Bibles are filled with verses like this. I put in your notes Isaiah 42 or 43, 2 and 3, right? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Right, that's a picture, right, of not if you, did you follow that? Not if you're going to. It's when. When you land in a space, when you're with the disciples on the Sea of Galilee, you're staring at waves that are overwhelmingly pounding. You're looking at a wind that is howling. You're looking out into a sea of darkness. And you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, Jesus has led you there. What are you going to do right there in that moment? What I want to encourage you to do is move, move towards it. Embrace that space of uncertainty knowing this. Jesus is developing some roots of faith and trust and dependence on him. So stick your feet out the door. Right there, you're going to stare at 13,000 feet of uncertainty. And if we can begin to embrace it, we'll begin to see like what is Jesus building in us. I love how John Henry Jowett, I'm sure somewhere along the way in your Bible and theology classes, you're going to come across him, mid to late 1800s British preacher. He said it so well. He said, it is possible to evade a multitude of sorrows through the cultivation of an insignificant life. Stay with me here. Indeed, if a man's ambition is to avoid the troubles of life, the recipe is simple. Shed your ambitions in every direction. Cut the wings of every soaring purpose and seek a life with the fewest contacts and relations. If you want to get through the world, hear this, with the smallest trouble, you must reduce yourself to the smallest compass. Tiny souls can dodge through life. Bigger souls are blocked at every side. As soon as a man begins to enlarge his life, his resistances are multiplied. Students, I promise you, your thousand days at this university, your compass is being enlarged. And in that enlarging, make no mistake about it, your uncertainties and your resistances are multiplied. And what Jesus would want you to see is, that's a good thing, that's a God thing, that's where he's meeting you on the waves and in the wind. Are you tracking with me? So when you're standing there and you hear him whisper into your ear, stick your feet out the door. It's okay to confess, Lord, I can't see, I don't know, I don't, I don't know that I can do this. Right there, move toward that space of uncertainty. Now watch what happens in the story. We're going to verse 19. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles. Hey, those of you who hit the gym a lot around here, Dr. White, do we have rowing machines in the gym over here? So now, hey, try going three or three and a half miles on the rowing machine. By the way, indoor climate. And watch how your legs and your arms are burning then. These guys are rowing three and three and a half miles against the wind, against the wave. Their arms are burning. Their lungs are burning. It's a panic situation. You tracking here? This is a tough sledding situation for them. And look what they saw Jesus, notice, approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. So second point, right, from the story, kind of second observation is, notice how Jesus, he walks towards them. He walks towards us in our time of need. The wind is howling, the waves are pounding, it's dark, their arms are burning, they're about to give up, and Jesus is walking on water to get to them. I wonder if somebody, I wonder if the Lord brought somebody to chapel to simply hear this today. The Lord sees you. He hears your cries for help. He sees the level of difficulty in your circumstances. He's attentive to your longing. He's attentive to your sighing. He's attentive to the depth of the uncertainty. He sees, he knows, he understands, he's aware. And hear this, and he's walking on water to get to you. Do you see him? But if we're honest, we're a lot like the disciples here. I know for me, I can get so focused on the seas and the wind and the waves and the circumstances and the uncertainty that I miss Jesus. 
That can happen, right, when we're going through tough times. We can get so focused on our own pain and our own struggle that we miss how Jesus is coming to us. And maybe this morning is just a moment to lift your eyes up above whatever circumstantial chaos you're in and to see how Jesus is walking on water to get to you. And when he gets to him, what does he say? In verse 20, he said, it is I. Do not be afraid. The translation, right, on the it is I, do not be afraid, the translation of that line, I am. Do not be afraid. Do you know how you can translate do not be afraid? Relax. Picture Jesus walking on water to get to them and he comes to them, I am. Relax. I am is here. We're gonna get through this together. Have you noticed that when Jesus comes to us in our storms, when he walks on water to get to us, man, I so appreciate it when he deals with the circumstantial seas, wind, and waves, like he calms the circumstances. Isn't that wonderful when he does that? That's the things like when you're praying about something on Sunday in church, and by Wednesday, it's like all resolved and worked out. You've seen breakthrough. You've seen everything, the water's just calmed down, and the winds. Isn't that wonderful when Jesus does that? It is, but I find it's much more much more common that Jesus walks on water through the storms and he's coming to calm the storm in here. Sometimes Jesus deals with the storm out there. We've got plenty of stories in the gospel about that. And then most of the time, I think Jesus comes for us and deals with the storm in here. He calms us in the middle of that storm. Are you tracking with me? Because hear this now. It's for Jesus, just like in the space of uncertainty, it's a big deal with him to develop us in faith and trust and confidence and dependence on him. That's top shelf stuff for Jesus. Also in this space right here, do you see that when Jesus comes for us and doesn't necessarily calm the circumstances but deals with us, do you see that he's not just interested in getting the disciples to Capernaum? Hear this, he's not just interested in getting them from A to B. I can become very focused on A to B, just A to B. Jesus is interested in who we're becoming on the journey from A to B. So when we get to B, what are we representing? How are we representing him? He's not just concerned with getting them to Capernaum. He's concerned with who they'll be when they get there. I suspect that's a word for all of us in here at some level. That whatever storm you're facing, whatever wind and waves are crashing in, and you... To hear that, hey, Jesus hears your cry. He's attentive to your prayer. The circumstances may not be calmed around you, but he's coming to calm the storm inside of you because he wants to develop you on the journey from A to B. Third step here, verse 21 and following. Then they were willing. Notice this. Then they were willing to what? Take him into the boat. What a statement. Do you see the act of trust that is? Take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. There are two miracles in this story. The first miracle is Jesus walking on water. The second miracle is, how about he gets into the boat and it's like he got an 80 horsepower mercury strapped on the back of that canoe and boom, they're over to Capernaum. That had to be quite the scene. There they're straining, right? Their arms are burning. And then Jesus steps in the boat and they're like creating a wake behind their canoe. They're all the way over to Capernaum. And so I put kind of the third reflection for us this morning and then we'll draw to a decision point. Is that when you take Jesus into your boat, we get to where we need to go. So the first observation is, we need to recognize Jesus is gonna lead us into space of uncertainty and to not resist it, but to embrace it. The, the, the second observation has to do with, right, when, when he walks towards us in our time of need. He hears our cries. He's attentive to our needs. He's coming towards us, often not to the calm the circumstantial chaos, but to calm the storm inside of us. And then thirdly, when we take Jesus into our boat, we get to where we need to go. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a meteorologist. I wanted to be like Mike Lozano on Channel 13 News, Des Moines, Iowa. I wanted to be like Mike before Michael Jordan was ever on the scene. Mike Lozano, he had a, he had a, I mean, I, he, he had the life. I said, so I, I said to my mom, I said, Mom, I want to write Mike Lozano a letter. 10, 11, 12 years old, somewhere in there. I wrote Mike Lozano a letter, and he wrote me back. My letter said, Mike, I want to be like you. Help me learn how to be a meteorologist, a weatherman. He wrote me a letter back. I was so excited when I got to the mailbox. It's like, like Mike Lozano, he wrote me a letter. I'm holding the envelope. And my mom said, well, open it up and read it. 
The opening lines of the letter went something like this. Dear Eric, thank you for your note. In regards to your question about being a weatherman, whatever you do with your life, don't do this. Being a meteorologist, terrible pay, terrible hours, terrible family life, just a generally terrible life. At the end, I thought, this guy sounds like he needs therapy. He like... <laughs> and he says, so whatever you do, don't do this. I wish you the best, Mike Lozano. I'm holding it. My meteorological dreams just got crushed. I mean, it just burst my meteorological bubble right there. Mike Lozano hates his life. My hero hates his life. So I bailed on meteorology. I'm not a weatherman now. I said, I'm going to be an aerospace engineer. I go to Iowa State University, aerospace engineering. Got engineers in the house here. Where's our engineers? Yeah, I took my first physics class. Peace out. Amen. Right? Anybody else? By the way? Peace out. Physics is great. Glad there's a lot of smart people who know physics. I'm not one of them. So that's not the pathway for Eric Simpson. So I run over to the business college. I join a degree called Management Information Systems. I don't know what the equivalent here is at Cedarville, but it's a combination of like computer science and business management, and they merged it in. You know, back in the Stone Ages, like late 80s, early 90s, okay? So, but they were merging it in, MIS degree. So from meteorology to aerospace engineering to computer science to business, straight path to pastoral ministry. Students, all I want to say is this. Hey, when you take Jesus, hear this. When you take Jesus into your boat, he's, he is faithful to get you where you need to be. So take a deep breath. I am is here. Relax. Relax. Take Jesus into your boat. Release your grip on the wheel, loosen the grip, raise the sail, catch the wind of the Spirit. Let Him take you to whatever your personal Capernaum is. He will get you there. Do you know 98 times in John's Gospel, John says this way, believe Jesus, trust Jesus. 98 times in the Gospel, trust Jesus. I thought about that could be a banner. I know Dr. White's leading you through Nehemiah, right? Faithful God, therefore to trust in him. I thought this picture, right, of all the things put together for you at Cedarville, that could be a banner hung over all of it. The chapel services, the discipleship groups, the prayer gatherings, the worship services, the worship nights, all these things that are put in place. Do you know what? The, at the core of all of it, all the faculty mentoring that's available, at all, the core of all of it is this, trust Jesus. That's right. Trust him. Bring him into your boat. No matter how dark the circumstances, no matter how overwhelming the waves, no matter how uncertain the territory you're in, bring Jesus into your boat. Loosen the grip. Raise the sail. Catch the wind of the Spirit. Relax. He's going to get you where you need to be. And you've got amazing resources here. I thought of all the career counseling resources. Take advantage of all of that. But as you're doing that, do so in this posture of what I think is being demonstrated here in John 6. I am, do not be afraid. Well, I stuck my feet out the door. And I kept falling. And falling. And I didn't breathe. <laughs> around 20 to 30 seconds is my best guess where I took a breath. I didn't black out, thankfully. But somewhere around the 20 to 30 second mark, as I'm falling through a cloud, think about that sentence for a minute. I've never fallen through a cloud before, okay? It was like falling through a mister. And in my brain it went, what are you doing? You're falling through a cloud. And right there I thought, I'm gonna meet Jesus face to face, like right here. I'm going to die. Like somewhere around the 30-second free fall, 127 miles, I'm going to die. Luigi's doing all this stuff. I'm out. Please, Luigi. I got nothing for you, photo guy. I got nothing. Lily's got all these wonderful smiling thumbs up shot. Dad's got none. I'm going to die. And then he pulls the ripcord. And the chute opens. And we go from 127 to silent. 
And Matt leads into me with his British accent and says, Eric, are you okay? I said, I don't know. He said, grab these handles above you, the handles to the parachute. He said, you want to spin? I go, what do I got to lose at this point? I'm already going to die. So he said, pull hard right. I pull hard right. We do this like tornado spin like I've never done before. Pull hard left, tornado spin. I go, okay, 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 I'm good, 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 good. And just about the time we're coming in for a landing, right? Coming in for a landing. Remember, Matt's like, hey, Eric, remember? Yeah, remember that? Like, you got to like lift your legs up and you're going to come in for the landing. Here's how it's going to be. You're going to come in and you're going to kind of scoot on your bottom that way and then he's going to take the brunt of the impact. So we come into the landing this way and we hit the ground, and Stu's like, <laughs> I look up at the sky, I said, Jesus, thank you, I'm alive. <laughs> thank you for the grass, and the sun, and the sky, and the ground, and I'm alive. And over my right-hand shoulder, I hear Lily. She's screaming, ah, it's amazing, Dad, are you okay? And it was awesome. And she runs towards me. And there was this embrace. And she says this to me. She says, Dad, here's the quote, exact quote, I'll never forget it. Quote, Dad, that took every ounce of courage I had in me, comma, but I'm so glad I did it. And I'm holding her and I go, honey, that took every ounce of courage I had in me. And I'm so glad I'm alive. So students, here's my question. What 13,000 foot threshold does Jesus have you at today? You're not strapped to a British guy named Matt. You're strapped to Jesus of Nazareth. And he leans into you this morning and he says to you six words. Stick your feet out the door. There should be a trust envelope at everyone's seat. Here's how we're going to wrap this up today. Okay, this trust envelope should be at everyone's seat, right at the floor area. Pull that out. There should be a white index card right here. Okay, students, there's one to kind of draw all this together, all right? On this index card, I want you to write one thing. Not five things, not ten things. One thing this morning, that you sense the Spirit of God saying to you, could have been long before this chapel service, whatever, that you sense God saying to you, trust me with this. Write it on here. No one's going to see it. No one's going to open these. No one's going to look at them. This is between you and the Lord. Write the one thing you know where Jesus is leaning in towards you and saying, hey, trust me. I am. Don't be afraid. Trust me. Stick that in the, write it down, stick it in the envelope, okay? Seal the envelope, all right? And then for a moment, take the envelope, turn it over. Hold the envelope with this side facing up. Take a look at it. And now I want you to picture yourself at 13,000 feet. And your tandem jumper is Jesus. And he cinches up the straps and he leans in. Trust. I am. Do not be afraid. Stick your feet out the door. Walk toward that uncertainty. Lift up your eyes and see how Jesus is coming toward you. Take him into your boat and rest in this. He's going to get you where you need to be with whatever it is here. On your way, I'm going to pray here to wrap us up. And then on your way out at all the exits somewhere, there's a place for you to leave these. The point students and faculty, like all the faculty participate in this as well. The point is we leave these here in the sanctuary. 
as an act of our trust, our faith, we're going to leave these here. We don't, we're not taking them with. We leave them here. And between you and the Lord, what's in your trust envelope? And maybe in your discipleship groups or in your other mentoring groups, other conversations, you can talk and pray for one another if you want to open up about, hey, what's in the trust envelope that way? But picture Jesus saying that to you over whatever's on that card. And when you come to chapel over the next days ahead, remember, remember that little, make that little altar. It's your little altar moment. Remember when you, when you laid it down. Remember, don't pick it back up. You laid it down. You trust him. Let's pray. Jesus, I've had a sense for a lot of weeks leading into this moment. It's a whole lot of stuff that you're at work in these students and faculty's lives. Just say, trust me with this. And so we bring our uncertainty to you. We confess how storm focused we get. We lift our eyes up and see how you're walking on water to get to us. And we just right now as an act of faith and trust and dependence on you, we take you into our boat afresh. We loosen the grip. We raise the sail. When I catch the wind of the Spirit, you have your way. We lay these things down at your feet as an act of trust. We trust you, Lord. I am. Do not be afraid. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. You're dismissed.